So if you have a favorite ology or an ology you want to share with the world today, drop it in the chat. Um, we are going to get started, and uh, by that I mean I'm going to say that my name is Marisa Gomez, and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, where you are all members, so thank you for supporting the museum. I'm joined, as always, for our Collections Close-Up webinars um, by our Collections Manager, Kathleen Aston. Hello, Kathleen. Hello, Marisa and friends. <laughs> um, so before we start talking about eggs, which very excited about. Um, I do just have a few uh, housekeeping measures to go through. So um, first, we want to acknowledge that the museum and our collections reside on the traditional and unceded territory of the UP tribe of the Awaswaz Nation. And today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsun tribal band, whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast and the Amamutsun are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts and the Amamutsun Land Trust. Um, and as I mentioned, we're gonna be using the chat today. So uh, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat. If you change who you're sending your messages to from like the default, which I think should be host and pa panelists to everyone, then everyone um, joining us today can also read what it is that you're sharing. Um, oops, that went forward a bit. There we go, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we are practicing using the chat by sharing where you're streaming in from and what is your favorite ology, which we started today. So another thing that I thought would be fun, and so again, share your favorite ology, but also maybe share if you know what any of these ologies are, because I don't think I knew what oology was before Kathleen um, brought it to my attention. And there are some other ologies that maybe we haven't heard of yet. So I'm just gonna do like a rapid fire quiz. Um, and Kathleen, you can chime in verbally and then those of you joining us today can type it in. I'm nervous. Okay, here we go. I'm just, this is totally random. Biology. The study of life. Okay, good. Starting off with one that we use kind of uh, frequently. What about? Enology, which is E N O L O G Y. Let me the put study, it. It's like this. There. Is it the study of Enneagrams? No, but that. Is there a study of Enneagrams? I'm sure. Enneology. Um, no, Enology. Does anyone, anyone want to chime in in the chat on that one? Um, I don't really know like the root for this, why it would be that, but it's wine. Apparently. Oh, it's missing an O. It's oniology is the study of wine, I think. Okay. Well, this website is called dummies.com. So, <laughs> okay. Let's see if this one's going to be uh, right. What about gerontology? Am I still guessing verbally? Yeah, you're guessing verbally. And people this, can also use the chat. The study of, yeah. All right, oh, Sue. Sue. Great. Yep. Um, aging. Exactly. Okay, um, I'm going to start in the chat first. Ichthyology. Should we give it a second? Da -da -da. Fish. Okay, okay Sue's, right. Sue's digging this game. I love it. And Juliana. <laughs> okay, what about um, kinesiology? This is something I remember from college. How our bodies are made of rubber bands. <laughs> Basically, yes. Movement, body movement. Um, let's see, what about... Okay, this is a weird one. <laughs> Teleology? The study of the end of the world? Why do you say that? Because teleolo teleological means something is like comes back to itself. It's about endings. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good job. It's this one says it's um, the study of final causes. Oh, so maybe something kind of like that. Um, all right. Are there any like really good ones that we should end on? Is it final causes or final countdown? <laughs> uh, oh, <laughs> okay. Hold on. Um, there we go. S Gall, eschatology or eschatology? 
Is that also the study of the end of the world? Yeah, that's the study of the end of time. <laughs> Okay, right. enough right. of that. You guys came to learn about eggs, right? So let's get to <laughs> oology. <laughs> um, and yeah, Kathleen. So uh, if you have questions, type them in the chat and maybe I'll interrupt Kathleen with them or we'll save them for the end. Um, and yeah, take it away. Okay, cool. Um, it's really, it's fun to do one of these again. It's been a little while, so I'm excited to see you all. And as we know, I usually always mess up my screen share at least <laughs> once in a different way every time. So I'm really excited to share that moment with you all today, but it seems like it's not gonna happen yet. You did great. We'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> um, all right, so welcome everyone to Old Time Oology, um, which is my understanding that's the pronun pronunciation of this particular ology, but it is an older word. So I'm happy to hear other opinions, um, other authorities on that matter. Um, we're going to take a deeper dive into this subject, which we've looked at in a couple different contexts as part of the collections close-up series, but it is one of my favorite collections to look at uh, because these eggs are gorgeous. Uh, what can I say? Um, and because they have a lot to say about the history of science and shifting collections practices, which is some of the most interesting stuff I think in our collection, especially with stuff like this, where we have older specimens that are also more well-documented from an older period. So. I'm excited for us to take a look at those today. Um, so one of the things I did want to sort of just make sure we're clear on, oology, the study of eggs, we've talked about that. Sometimes it is more broadly taken to meaning the study of um, bird eggs, nests, and nesting behavior. Um, and, you know, it also shared space at the turn of the 19th century when it was more popular with this term nidology or nidology, which is the study of nests. Um, so you might also see that if you start getting into this subject today, both of these are considered subjects of the modern discipline of ornithology, a word I'm going to say a lot during this talk, which I will probably flub a couple of times. Thanks for your patience. Um, but these more niche terms reflect the strong subcultures of what at that time were called eggers rather than or as compared to today's birders. Um, so looking at eggs, um, especially before it was easy to capture birds on camera, was one of the ways that people were getting engaged with the world of birds and able to learn about them. So they were wandering around the woods, like pocketing eggs, taking notes, um, and building these collections, um, which are precious both because they're fragile, they're eggshells, um, but also for their scientific relevance. Um, so when we're talking about eggs as collections items, we're generally talking about dried, empty shell collections. Um, so these are, they're like a, we've got a diagram here. Um, and shows that they are these semi-permeable, rigid calcium carbonate structures that have been emptied of the yolk and any embryos and things like this. Um, we have developed techniques in science for um, you know, testing these trace components of things like the embryo or the yolk, um, and they can still be scientifically viable after a century, but that can be a little bit challenging. Sometimes we'll talk about that more later. Um, so the rigidity of eggs makes them, you know, kind of brittle and in that way fragile, but it also has some good sides. Um, they maintain their shape over time. And so one important way of science looking at them is looking at morphological analysis or like these different sort of differences in shapes across different eggs or different species. Um, and this diagram is from a study that I think we'll send along that's super readable that I really enjoyed while looking at for this talk called Cracking the Egg, the Use of Modern and Fossil Eggs for Ecological, Environmental, and Biological Interpretation. It is very fun, I promise. The beginning pun is very helpful. Um, so the durability of eggs when they're appropriately cared for is part of what's reflected by the enormity of the world's egg collections. Um, and they are enormous. All told, there's something like 5 million eggs housed in just the world's museums that we know about. Um, and, you know, every year more collections are donated from the public sector, excuse me, the private sector into the public, so that can change. Um, but some of these collections span up to 200 years of temporal coverage. Um, and so that's a huge amount of scope, both in quantity and time, and both of those things increases their usefulness for scientific research and education. Um, some of these collections are from hobbyists, like the one in this picture, which we'll see a little bit more, and they're given to museums after they've been cherished by amateur collectors. But others are the product of government-sponsored collecting trips where the goal was often to gather as much as you possibly could, um, as many different eggs and as many different places in the service of describing new species um, for Western science. Uh, there's a famous story that maybe we'll talk about a little bit later if we have time about an egger who um, coming under like, I think it was gunfire while collecting an egg, um, put it in his mouth and then ran back to his camp where his comrades had to extract his tooth in order to also extract the stuck egg without damaging the egg any further. 
Um, so people were really committed to this pursuit. These eggs were really valuable to them even in that time. Um, the most valuable collections to us today, for scientific study at least, are the ones that have rich collecting notes with things like clutch size, locality, collector, incubation status, nest construction, all these sorts of details. Um, and they were, you know, it was such a popular hobby that you could even get these purpose produced notebooks that have, um, you know, structured forms for how to fill out all this information and even produce like corresponding specimen cards. So that's what you're looking at here. These are some um, oology collection notebooks from our collection. Um, and it's a pretty common thing when you hear people talking about the relevance and value of old egg collections is um, to think about how, especially this sort of notion of how when things were collected relates to when those eggs were laid, gives us an opportunity to look at changing cli climate <clears throat> and environmental factors, um, you know, uh, at, as species have responded to different sorts of changes over time and, and how that has changed laying dates. Um, so if we have time throughout this talk, I'm gonna reference a few other of just like the many, many ways that museum egg collections have been used in science. Um, and also if we have a little time, I'll talk a bit about where we are at in the process of activating our egg collections for research access. Um, and so um, you might infer from these millions of eggs in collections, that this was a pretty popular hobby. Um, and indeed it was from the mid 1800s to the early 1900s across continental Europe, the UK, the US, there were publications like this, the Young Oologist, um, this is from 1885. There were clubs, there were societies, ones geared for adults, geared for kids. Um, the publications provided resources on you know, what people were seeing and learning, um, how to do things. Um, you could also purchase eggs or offer them for exchange, or you could buy tools. You see these advertisements here for egg drills. Um, and pipes to process the eggs because once you got the egg and you didn't want it to still have the um, you know interior content you would make a small hole with a with a pin or needle or drill um, and then a slightly larger small hole and then you could use a pipe to blow the material out of the specimen we can talk a little bit more about that and we'll see some of those marks in our egg collections and this is something we all not we all but a lot of us probably did as kids um, if we were ever messing around with like eggs um, to preserve and paint. Uh, and then uh, you also have these sort of, you know, equipment for collecting eggs, um, like these climbing irons. Very useful if you're going to do something um, like climb the craggly side of the cliffs on the Farallon Islands, um, looking for eggs for um, sale in San Francisco. Um, because this wasn't all just fun and games. There were a lot of people who were really interested in this as hobbyists, but it was also super serious business. And in this famous local example, armed groups of hunters, egg, vendor, egg vendors, and government officials participated in a decades long egg war over access to seabird eggs at the Farallon Islands. Um, so high demand for protein in a gold rush grown San Francisco after um, 1849 led commercial eggers to fight over the hundreds of thousands of eggs, um, primarily like colonial seabirds on the Farallon Islands. A big favorite was the common muir big egg, very pretty. We'll look at some of those um, that could be found each season in the numbers of like hundreds of thousands on those islands. And so they would go and they would collect them and then they would sell them for make bank in San Francisco. Um, it was treacherous for people. It was devastating for the bird populations and other wildlife. Um, and ultimately the armed clashes ex escalated until um, an assistant lighthouse keeper was attacked for collecting eggs just for food. Um, and the government forcibly evicted private interests from the islands in 1881. Um, so people, as we'll see, were still sometimes collecting from there, but it was no longer this like big intense industry. Um, a bit further down the coast, a different lighthouse sorry, keeper. Kathleen, uh, can I just, I'm sorry, was that the Moybridge of like the, this, the film fame, the yes. Stanford horse? Okay. Yeah, he, so Moybridge has a lot of great photos, including one of our lighthouse that we sometimes have at pop-up events. Um, and I think that I might not have spelled his name fully correctly while I was looking at that slide. Okay. Um, so apologies. Oh, cool. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. That's a that's a neat connection. No, and actually, um, I think that this is uh, this is from a Smithsonian article on the history of the Farallon Island egg wars that I think we'll be sending out as we do with our like email follow up of different links. And this image actually comes from an old stereograph because Moybridge photographed possibly to make. Uh, very vast that you could use like sort of a 3D type image. Uh, so yeah, again, apologies to Edward Moybridge if I spelled this wrong. 
Um, the Dr. Post, a uh, different White House teacher, was not to be left out of the um, logical enterprise, um, though at a much less catastrophic level. Our Laura Hecox, lover of tide pools, fossils, and shells, was also an avid fan of avifauna. Um, these interests were reflected in her scrapbooks, where we see wide-ranging articles about different kinds of birds, their nesting strategies, and the lengths to which ornithologists would go to understand these fairy tales of ornithology. Um, these clippings from her scrapbooks range in date, but are generally from the late 1880s and 1890s. Um, we also see her keeping note, as she did with female lighthouse keepers, of contributions to the field by female ornithologists. These clippings on the left are from an article by Olive Thorne Miller, whose real name was Harriet Mann Miller. They were part of a larger body of ornithological nature writing that actually inspired the American Ornithological Union um, to promote Harriet to a special level of membership uh, for service to the field. And she was one of the first three women to ever be recognized like this in the early, and it was in the early 1900s, I think like 1901 but I'll get back to you on that. Um, and the illustration from the right is not from Laura's scrapbooks from a work entitled um, Illustrations of the Nests and Eggs of the Birds of Ohio, which would have been published around the same time as Laura clipped her articles. Um, it's a suite of stunning lithographic illustrations of eggs and nests, which earned the original author Genevieve Howard the contemporary nickname of America's Other Audubon. Um, the books were too expensive really to be broadly available at the time that they were published um, in 1886, but I think that Laura would have been a big fan. Um, and Genevieve's story is tragic, but also remarkable and worth reading. And I think we're also going to send that out to you in the spirit of Women's History Month, um, which we all love. Um, so, of course, Laura was not only interested in illustrations of stories and birds, she was also interested in the specimens. You can see in this um, Santa Cruz Sentinel newspaper article on the right of this slide um, that she was, you know, at the fair in 1891 showcasing um, the egg shell, wait, birds and eggs collections of her friends um, E. H. Fisk and R. C. McGregor, and that was actually Mr. Fisk, not Mrs. Fisk. The paper got it wrong, unfortunately. Um, and I say friends not because we have like, you know correspondence or anything like this between the two of them, but because we have these adorable bird themed bakery cards um, that were indicated that Laura sometimes got deliveries from Pioneer Bakery, compliments of E.H. Fisk and a tiny bird or a dog um, attacking a duck um, that she then pasted in her notebook. Um, and I also say that, you know, I think perhaps they were friends or at least they knew each other because she was helping with these collections at the fair and also because we know from our catalog records that both Fisk and McGregor gifted her specimens. Um, for example, this horned lark, um, which is the photo on the right, not the left, uh, which McGregor collected in Denver in February of 1890. Um, McGregor, there's a little bit more known about him. He was well known for birding trips to the Philippines when he passed away. Um, the AUK, the American Ornithological Union's publication, um, published a biography of him that was full of high praise. Um, a little bit less is known of Fisk. Other than that, he lived for at least five years in Santa Cruz and was for some of those years a co-proprietor of a pro-temperance uh, dining establishment, um, which is interesting because the Hecox family was also very involved in the temperance movement. Um, we also know that Fisk and McGregor co-authored this early birding checklist for the vicinity within 20 miles of the lighthouse at Santa Cruz. And a lot of this, it's a great checklist. We might also send this out as well that has some stuff that's just very much like we've seen this bird here and some stuff that's a little bit more anecdotal, um, which we always enjoy. Uh, we like science, but we also like anecdotes. Um, so McGregor gave Laura a handful of birds and Fisk appears to have given her hundreds of eggs. Um, the FISC eggs vary widely in their origins, but generally have collecting data, clutch information, collector ID, and locality info. Um, this is a set of local specimens. Uh, and I was going to make you guys guess, but instead I'll just let you know um, who is who here. Um, some of this might surprise you. Uh, I know that, you know, the red winged blackbird bottom middle. Um, I expected to be a little bit more blue just from having worked in our egg collections and seen um, other specimens uh, that were a different color of red winged blackbird eggs. Um, but here I want to like dip into a couple highlights of the collection. I'm going to start with those. Um, it's exciting that we see that this is a, you know, a specimen that was collected here in Santa Cruz in 1885. 
I'm very excited that we still have a bunch of, uh, you know, that we were able to steward these eggs over all that time, given the journeys our museum has been on, um, which you have heard about in a different collections close up. Um, but it also begs the question, you know, if you look at the Ornell, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they confirm that blackbird eggs, red winged blackbird eggs tend to be like blue, green to gray in color. Um, so what's happening here? Like, are these faded? We don't know their exact storage history for the first 50 years or so. Um, you know, does that have consequences for what kind of information, you know, a research scientist could get from looking at these specimens? Um, and, and the answer is yes and no. Um, recent studies, because comparing egg color, pigmentation and color across different egg specimens has been an important way that scientists learn more information about sort of the evolutionary ecology of birds. Um, but because there are these millions and because there are these millions of eggs in collections, um, they provide a lot of opportunities for data if, you know, the methodological, if the method methodology is valid. Um, and so more recently, there have been a lot of articles where people are saying like, oh, can I actually, you know, what is the validity of this information if there's a possibility that eggs have faded? Um, and there's a 2010 study that talks looking at eggshells and collections in the UK and New Zealand, for example, um, that supports, you know, using eggs museum eggs for looking at pigment vari variation, um, as long as you are considering various factors and looking at specimens that were collected at the same time originally. Um, so, and there's like a couple other more studies that I'm just like excited about uh, that I will probably save for the end if we have time. Um, so moving right along um, and speaking of, you know, eggs that are a bit further afield, most of the Fisk collection will, so the Fisk collection contains eggs from as far away as Australia, Europe, Canada, um, but most of the ones that he himself collected came from California, um, also some in Colorado. Um, and he would often send in collecting notes and we have a number of, uh, you know, descriptions from him in the 1880s writing into these zoological magazines from Santa Cruz, California, talking about various, um, uh, efforts and uh, shenanigans that occurred while he was collecting specimens, including the time that an owl tried to fight him away from a red-tailed hawk nest. Um, so uh, speaking of fights, I also thought it was really interesting looking at highlights of this collection um, in advance of this event that we have a pigeon guillemot egg too from the Farallon Islands um, and actually looking at the collecting record, they were collected by the lighthouse keeper there and then given to Fisk. Um, and so it's interesting because this is only a few years after the government kicked private interests out of the islands in, I think, 1891. Um, and so we don't have a ton of narrative about what else was happening at that time, but these two eggs then become a data point in the landscape of the islands um, in the aftermath of the egg wars as they were starting to wane a little bit for a variety of reasons. Um, and then let me, speaking of loving this pattern, because a lot of these are beautiful, but I think that these are perhaps the most beautiful um, of all the eggs, at least that I have been looking at lately. Um, and uh, these are the Muir eggs uh, or common Muir eggs, um, which would have been more sort of like the goal when people eggers were going to the Farallon Islands um, because they were for a number of reasons, but uh, in part because they were like meatier, bigger. Um, and we don't have a lot of like clear collection data on exactly where these came from. They might not be from the Farallons. Um, but they are stunning. And so I wanted to make sure you guys got a chance to see them. And it was also uh, reminding me of in this Smithsonian Magazine article, the um, egg wars uh, people would talk about. There was a rumor that if you spent too much time on the Farallons, you would start to see your name spelled out in the highly variable patterns of these mirror eggs, um, which I haven't looked at them that long, but I think I'm getting there. Um, so another highlight of this collection, uh, I think this will be our last one for tonight for this particular subcollection is this uh, set of three Ridgeways rail eggs. Um, so these were collected in Santa Clara County in 1890. And at the time they were called California clapper rail eggs. Um, so the clapper rail, uh, the taxonomic split in the rail family that made it so that these eggs are now Ridgeways rail eggs only happened um, in I think 2014. Um, but these birds have been federally listed as endangered, I think, since the 1970s, um, in large part due to the destruction of their wetland habitat. So having these, um, these are, again, just like another set of really precious eggs within our collections. Um, 
And I also, while I was looking closely at them, I thought these were like good examples of just like slight variations in the drill holes that would be put in eggs while you were, you know, blowing out the yolk. Um, and you can also see these like penciled in numbers, which were, I believe, American Ornithological Union designations that folks used to catalog eggs. Um, and then here's a catalog book. Um, again, you know, we saw some of these earlier from Fisk's notes, um, where you can see the original common name, the California Clapper Rail name, as well as a note on the back of the card that talks about um, where Fisk got the specimen, because this is one that he had in exchange from someone who so was also out here trading eggs with different people. Uh, so I also really quick, you know, that was sort of the, the heart of our you know, most significant egg collections is a subset that was collected by Fisk or developed by Fisk and then given to Laura. And they're mostly from like 1880-ish um, to I think 1880, 18, mid 1890s. Um, it would have been before the museum came together in 1904. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about where we at. We're managing, you know, our overall egg collections um, and what we're doing with them right now. Um, so we have just completed transcribing um, the final 288 records from these collections, which represents probably about 500 eggs because a lot of them were lot cataloged. Um, and now that we have, oh, we've finished transcribing them and then transferring them into our database, which um, sets us up well to do a full inventory and rehousing of these specimens. Um, we want these eggs to last for at least another 137 years. And so that means that even though they've been pretty stable in this like cute little clustery box here, um, we wanna make them, you know, in, into even cozier um, and more best practice homes. So, you know, creating like nests for them out of <clears throat> archival cotton batting and things like this. So uh, once we have our inventory updated and we have things rehoused in our archival materials, we'll be publishing information to our website um, and submitting it to biodiversity data sharing portals, which is very fun, lots of big fun words. Um, speaking of fun, um, one of the last sort of like sub collection area highlights I wanted to talk about was this wooden cabinet that's featured in our um, event advertisements, which has been out at least a handful of times in the past couple of years um, on exhibit for museum visitors. And this cabinet is so cute um, and really puts the old timey charm and the old time oology as far as I'm concerned. Um, but it also presents, uh, you know, a preservation concern. Um, wood can release acids that can be, you know, have a negative effect on eggs and cause them problems, especially over long periods of time. Um, and this particular collection um, came, was developed starting in the early 1900s um, by this man named Ben Black, here featured with his pet owl, Aldi. He started it when he was a young uh, kid in Ireland, um, and then his family moved to Santa Cruz when he was a little bit older, um, and he continued the collections for some years and cherished it for many years after that until his daughter gave, and then ultimately his daughter gave it to us. Um, and I also just wanted to share, these are uh, some, I think, I have so many favorites, but these land rail eggs um, are also a favorite of mine. Um, and they are an example of, you know, a far distant, in fact, European specimen in our collections. Um, and these are more commonly called the corn crake. Um, and they're found in parts of Europe and Asia. Um, so looking at this collection, super charming. Um, but even though, you know, that's that sort of species was found in like parts of Europe and Asia, we don't have collecting data um, for a lot of these beautiful eggs. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not valuable. It becomes valuable in a bit of a different way as a window sort of into the history of science and these changing patterns of collecting. And it's really impactful when people are able to see it and engage with it. And so by keeping these eggs in this cabinet um, and monitoring any changing conditions, any concerns we see in their quality allows us to continue to tell that collecting story. Um, and uh, fun fact, we have not, you know, apparently someone in doing an inventory of this cabinet missed or did not see fit to mention in previous years, um, this like oological tool. I was trying to like make a toolology joke, but I think that I would mess it up too much. Um, this like little glass element uh, next to these two green eggs, um, which might be partridge eggs, um, might have been an old form of, uh, you know, blowpipe for blowing out like the yolk from an egg. Also, if any of you get bitten by the old time oology bug and start looking through these sort of older public domain PDFs that have catalogs and advertisements, I was not able to find an illustration or a schematic of an egg drill um, or any other similar kind of tool. And I would love to see one. So email me if you find something. 
Um, so old timey wooden cabinet is captivating um, in part because so many things have changed since it was developed. Um, so it's no longer super acceptable. It's, it's no longer acceptable or even legal in most cases um, to be collecting eggs as a hobby, um, similarly to the way in which it is no longer acceptable to be, um, you know, the widespread popularity of hats made of egret feathers and other birds who were driven almost near to distinction, extinction um, or to extinction itself um, in the early 1900s uh, in response to sort of trends like these hats here. Um, so while this was going on, while, you know, lots of, you know, the, the egg, the environmental destruction in the Farallon Islands or, you know, the hat trade, you know, having a big effect on bird populations, um, even, you know, starting as early as like the very early 1900s, um, it's not that everyone was okay with this. There was a lot of like pushback. Um, folks even started writing books about like ethical and responsible ways to do egg collecting. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, in 1916, um, the, an international, wait, the Migratory Bird Treaty of 1916 was codified into the Migratory Bird Act of 1918 um, to create a bunch of protections for birds, um, their eggs, their nests, any bird body parts um, that has been credited with saving numerous species from extinction, um, including, according to Audubon Society, the snowy egret, the wood duck, and the sandhill crane, if not many more. Um, so as a museum, part of our role is to help encourage interest in specimens while also promoting proper permit-based collection. So thinking about the Migratory Bird Act and following appropriate procedures for how we handle permits or any specimens we have is an important part of that. Talking to people when they reach out because they might have encountered a specimen um, and talking about the appropriate way to handle that or to transfer it to us is something that we do a lot of talking about today at the museum. Um, and on that note, I have a little bit more I can say about this and actually several other things, including some very scandalous, uh, more contemporary news about egg theft. Um, but I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, I, I think, um, maybe, so if anyone has, I, I have a, a few slides to share about what the museum's doing today when it comes to birds, but also um, maybe we could pause for some questions too. I have a couple of questions. So if anyone out there also has questions, you can get to typing. Um, one question, I don't know if you talked about this in your opening slides and I missed it, but I was noticing that all of the holes are, so like if the egg is kind of like oval like this, the holes are on, you know, over here. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Uh, you mean like not at the tops there? Yeah, the like middle. not at the top and the bottom. They're like on the side. Yeah. So from my understanding, it has to do with like the structural integrity, but also people wanting things to look pretty. And so if you do it from the top and the bottom, they, that wouldn't look as I think it, it wouldn't look as pretty. And then also I was reading accounts of people like having really strong opinions. And this is still something, so like people do still collect eggs in contemporary scientific practice. It's not as common as other things. And there's a, it's really resource intensive. It's like hard to do. You have to wait a lot um, and you have to like be really careful in terms of how you get permitting. So there are still modern people, like contemporary folks doing this, but um, I've been spending a lot of time with the people who were doing this in the late 1800s and they were really sworn into certain ways of doing the egg drill. And I think that another thing about like having it in the middle had something to do with being like at that wider point, it was easier to try to get more of the yolk out without damaging the egg because everyone was really doing their best to try to, uh, yeah, to, to keep the eggshell as intact while getting as much of the center out as possible. And that's also why, and you didn't ask this, but I think I meant to say it and I didn't have, I didn't have time. Um, people were often trying to, when they were collecting eggs, they were trying to collect them as fresh as possible. They had eggs that hadn't been incubated for very long so that there wasn't quite as much going on in there and it'd be easier to get the contents out without the egg mm -hmm. breaking. And so that's part of why, um, like how many days of incubation was tracked in these early catalog records, which is really helpful for contemporary scientific projects. Yeah, that's really interesting. I was um, in a talk we had last week about um, pollinators, I learned that when pinning insect specimens, you're not supposed to pin like right down the middle because there might be something that's identifiable that's right down the middle that you're covering, whereas insects are symmetrical. And so you like, if you pin just slightly to the side, it's okay because whatever you, 
you know, pinned through is also on the other side. Um, so Marissa, why happens. don't I go to all of our talks? I know. Well, they're all, they're recorded. So you can they're recorded. Them. Why? Yeah. You can find them on the website. <laughs> um, okay, great. And then also I had this thought that I would really like to look at a bunch of eggs and I gather now that we have a bunch of eggs in our collection um, and like notice the differences. I've never spent a lot of time like thinking about identifying birds by looking at eggs and being able to say like, oh, that's a robin egg or oh, that's a pigeon gill egg. Um, but I think that would be like a really neat nature journaling practice or, or something. So maybe we can find a way to, um, to look more closely at eggs all together. I think that would be fun. We definitely can do that. And I do think that that's something that I definitely feel very privileged to be working with these collections because they're not a collection that gets produced as much anymore. And so not as many people kind of, as I mentioned, like, you know, this used to be a way that people knew birds a lot. They would mm -hmm. spend their time getting to know birds through getting to know their eggs, through collecting them. And now we get to know birds in other ways. Um, and so I do think, yeah, I'm super interested in the idea of bringing more of these out more often so people can take a look at them and compare shapes, sizes, patterns that might have your name in them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was, I mean, the picture from Moybridge of the person scampering on the rocky cliff there, it like, I don't know, all of a sudden I felt horrified by this practice because I was like, oh, this is neat, this is neat. And then I was like, no, don't steal the egg from the nest. And then like connecting it with the fact that that's how these, that's why we have these collections is because someone went into someone's egg nest and took the egg it's sad it is and it's and it is something that like in these older like ethics of egg collecting books people start talking about like well don't take them all you don't there's no need to do that um and it's also kind of interesting people have looked at um scientists used to assume that egg clutches that are in museums would be biased towards the most like you would, uh -huh. you would tend to have like if you're looking at clutch data like size data from that, you would get um, collecting bias. And there has been evidence of collecting bias in a variety of ways, but was looking at a study that showed that actually, um, you know, eggers of the, the time period, I think it was like the UK in the early 1900s, um, were tending to get more like mid-level clutches rather than taking like the ones that just had the most they possibly could find. So I don't know if that has to do with ethics or just efficacy, but. Yeah, that is an interesting point. Um, Okay, and then in terms of contemporary research and egg collecting, you mentioned that you had a few other things that you were interested in sharing that you were saving. I'm curious, could you Do you want share? to talk first about science or about scandal? Scandal. Okay, let's talk about <laughs> scandal. I'm going to reshare my screen. Um, did I do it well? I did. Man, I haven't messed up screen sharing at all this time. Um, so uh, as I talked about in the beginning part of the talk, uh, this was a really popular hobby in the UK and Europe and the States, but apparently in Britain, people have not been able to get enough of it. And there have been in the, you know, up till 2018 is the most recent one I was looking at, but I think there might've been a couple more, but there are still these like high profile egg thief um, cases uh, where people have been found to just be secretly building up thousands and thousands of specimens, like of you know collections of thousands and thousands of specimens in their homes, and saying very silly things to police officers when they get discovered. Like this particular man told officers, "I've been a silly man, haven't I?" Upon <laughs> being arrested. And then there was a guy, I think in 2006, also in the UK, who when arrested was, uh, said something along the lines of like, thank God, now I can stop. Uh, <laughs> so is it that this is um, still popular in the UK or is it that the UK collectors just have more newsworthy remarks upon getting arrested. I mean, hard to about. say, hard <laughs> to say. Um, but it is also, you know, the UK has, uh, you know, the, I think it's in Trilling, I believe, the, where, where like um, a lot of their, the British Natural History Museum's uh, ornithological collections are held. And they do have, that is like a museum that has like a million eggs, like the world has 5 million, million that museum has a million. Um, and so, and they do like a lot of great outreach and they've got a lot of digitized collections. So maybe they're just, they're getting people more excited about it. And, and you know, sometimes people get really excited and then handle it in the wrong way. <laughs> um, and they be silly is what they do. 
Um, so that is one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, one of the studies I thought was really cool related to those mirror eggs is um, mirror eggs have a really high level of variability across just like the patterning on different eggs. Um, and some scientists were looking at egg patterns um, in colonial seabirds, so not just mirrors, but a couple of others, to see there have been observations of behavior where it seems that the birds can recognize their own eggs. And so they were doing these, like uh, using museum collections, which we love to see. Um, I was really keen to see um, even more contemporary articles, like this one is from 2019. So it's not just that like, you know, egg collections are done, they're a thing of the past, they are still being used regularly. And so they were analyzing um, just you know variance across different patterns and seeing if the most varied egg populations also corresponded to the species that had observed um, behaviors of being able to recognize individual eggs. Um, and I believe the conclusion was it has a bit to do with it. Um, but that's another article that I thought was super readable, which we can send out if people want to take a look. Um, the other article that I thought was really fun that I also will add to my list for you to send out, Marisa, is this one um, where someone was basically looking at, and I think this one is 2021. Um, and it's again, part of this sort of like suite of studies where people are like, yeah, we use egg collections in museums for all these different sorts of things. Um, but like, is that really working the way we think it is? How can we investigate the methodology that we have? And so this was looking at, um, how effective DNA sampling is at identifying eggs that have not been identified. So we do, you know, a small museum like ours uh, with a cluster of unidentified eggs might not be able to devote enough resources to getting all of those ID'd, but these museums that have like, you know, hundreds of thousands or thousands of specimens um, who can like do this as more of a common practice would benefit from looking at like how viable it is to do that. And then this study also like, uh, looked at how the size of the hole um, that was drilled out in the egg, whether or not that corresponded to what level of incubation um, the specimen was at when it was collected, um, thinking that these bigger holes would relate to more incubated eggs that were a little bit tougher to get out with a smaller hole. Um, and I think that they found that that was not a really firm correspondence. Mm -hmm. And with the DNA, so the DNA in the eggshell is the, the same DNA as the as the bird. Like there's, you can tell that as like the parent. Bird. Yeah, they were looking at it for the DNA just um, according to species, not yeah, the yeah, individual. That's what I meant. Yeah, and so they were they were taking they were like drilling little tiny chunks of uh, the shell off and then powdering it and then trying testing like different sorts of like the remains of the interior egg and then I think they had one other testing method and they were looking at these to see which was the best one for doing for getting like DNA ID based IDs of unidentified eggs. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Neat. Um. So so we're not doing that with our eggs at this time, as you mentioned, but we're doing some other stuff with birds. So I was just gonna quickly share um, some other goings on at the museum when it comes to birds, not so much eggs, maybe an egg will come up in these slides, um, but we, we just love birds at the museum. Our yeah. staff loves birds. And also our community here in Santa Cruz loves birds as we um, found out earlier this 2022 um, when a rare Lucy's warbler was spotted in Tyrrell Park right outside the museum. This is the lovely little warbler on um, our Cyanothus bush, but uh, staff members coming into work every day for like weeks um, or months even really were greeted by this scene <laughs> of just dozens of people just looking out into the willows and trying to spot this bird. Um, and it was lovely. And like I mentioned, our staff loves to do that too. And so um, our education coordinator, Chris, keeps uh, tabs on the birds in the park and adds it to this running um, spreadsheet that we have here. These are uh, spottings that have happened frequently, rarely. Um, you can see the Lucy's warbler on there. And this is a practice that we also share with students around uh, the county, not in the exact same way, but we have a uh, field trip that we've been offering for, I think, decades now um, called the Wetland Walk, which is in partnership with the city of Santa Cruz. And we lead 
groups of third grade students on this field trip where they hone their observational skills through curriculum that aligns with next generation science standards. And they learn about seasonality and adaptations while also learning about using graphs and collecting data. So you can see that we've got sort of field guides attached to their binoculars and then they take turns um, tallying up birds that we see and they make observations of, you know, which does that, which bird on this list does it look most like? Um, and they're able to, to come up with some descriptions. And their observations are added to the community science platform eBird, which is a really, really robust community science platform in large part because birders are great at taking notes, making lists, it's like part of the whole thing of if, if watching birds is your thing, then you're probably taking notes about it. Um, and so it's a really great platform. And these are the museum's uh, observations that we've added for this particular field trip. These are complete checklists. And then um, within the checklists, there's you can go like this is one field trip and they saw maybe 150 cedar wax wings. Um, that day. Sometimes you kind of uh, round it as well as some less common birds like the scaly breasted media. And another uh, way that we engage with uh, ornithology and oology even at the museum is through our exhibits. So you've all probably visited the museum and seen our taxidermy collection on display. We have a lot of birds that are permanently on display in the museum. But another way we do this is through our annual science illustration exhibit the art of nature which is opening in just a couple of weeks and so we're giving you a sneak peek at a couple of the birds that are featured in this uh year's show uh this lovely barn owl box from kathy kleinsteiber and this egret from laurel teague who's also uh just a really wonderful museum volunteer and we would be remiss if we didn't also look back on our staff's favorite event of the year, which is the Museum of the Macabre Halloween Party. And in 2019, our theme, I think it was, yeah, in 2019, our theme was the birds. Um, you may know that we have a Hitchcock connection here in town and uh, notably also with the movie, The Birds. And so we kind of uh, went off that theme and this was something that Kathleen and our collections assistant, Isabel, put together uh, showcasing bird diversity. And then also you can kind of get a, a little tease of an exploded bird display that Kathleen came up with. And um, during that same event, we also had students from the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History up at UC Santa Cruz doing live, in quotes, taxidermy uh, in the middle of this Halloween party, which um, we, we've had happen a couple of times at the museum, which is a big hit. And we love partnering with local organizations that have ties to different elements of natural history. And these are some examples of organizations that are connected with birds in some way that we partner with um, and that we have partnered with over the past couple of years. The Bird School Project, uh, Point Blue, we did uh, some programs with them about the snowy plover population at Seabright Beach across the street from the museum, Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History. We uh, help put on community outreach for the Monterey Bay Birding Festival. The Santa Cruz Bird Club is a longtime friend. Um, and then the city of Santa Cruz who supports our field trips at Miri Lagoon. And uh, with the Bird School Project, we have a partner event this weekend. So if you're interested in diving deeper into this topic of birds, you can join us for a family-friendly walk at Struve Slough in Watsonville. And this is a family-friendly walk also uh, with bilingual instructors and there's still space. So I'll include a link for that too, so that you can register if you wanna join us this weekend. And... I can't get out of here. Let me see. I don't know where my thing went. Oh, there it went. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. I really thought that maybe I had ended the Zoom meeting <laughs> on accident. <laughs> also, I just, I like that this time, I mean, it is you this time who does silly things <laughs> with screen sharing, not me. Marisa we got to share. 
yeah, yeah share the awkwardness. facilitate so many of my Zoom skills, but now the <laughs> teacher, the master becomes the student again. Uh, um, one last thing I forgot to do, Marisa, and for you know the folks at home is um, I realized that I didn't put a lot of scale information in the images I used for today's talk, honestly, because it wasn't quite as pretty as I wanted it to be. Um, but I did bring out a couple of the, so these, um, yes. the blackbird eggs, the red winged blackbird specimens um, are about yay big. So I think if I go here and then do that, it'll like give you a little bit more of a focus. Mm -hmm. um, so that's about the size of maybe the end of my nose <laughs> um, for scale. Although probably a lot of you don't have firsthand experience with this type of egg. Um, this is an ostrich egg that we also have in our collections. Mm. <laughs> My lighting isn't behaving as, oh, there it is, as I wanted it to. Um, so again, like, yeah, more the size of like, you know, my face, if we're getting like closer to it. Um, those are two things that I wanted to bring out. And then another thing that I just wanted to bring out quickly, which also might not show um, super well on the Zoom is just the uh, glass, what I think is potentially a blowpipe that was used in the Ben Black egg collection. Um, but I'm not quite sure, as again, I said, I, I didn't end up finding a lot of um, images or like very concrete descriptions of those tools. So if any of you guys run into them, you send them my way. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of what else that would be in that particular box. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, you know, I think we, we done did it and um, we are, we're already planning our next collections close-up event and it's not available to sign up for yet, but we're just going to give you a little teaser, which is that it's going to be in person. Woo! Um, and it's also going to be in partnership with some local artists. So it's going to be like a hands-on art workshop with, uh, with a collections component, which is very exciting. Um, we love it. So thanks uh, for joining us tonight, members. Thank you for being a member of the museum and your support. Uh, Kathleen is able to do all the great work that she does in stewarding our collections um, because of community support from people like you. So we always want to make sure that we we give you the thanks that you deserve. And uh, like Kathleen was alluding to, I'll be sending out an email with some links that she has curated for us, as well as links uh, to participate in future events and things like that. So have a great night. We hope that you join us for the exhibit opening reception of the Art of Nature. On April 1st, you're a member, so you're invited. You can register today and save Is that a joke? Spot. It's going to be great. It's not an April Fool's joke? It's a it's no joke. No joke. All Thanks right. I'm putting cool. up with my bad joke. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>